Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that's worth every penny of your hard-earned money. I am Mark Stucker and I'm a college coach. And I'm Anika Madden and I'm a parent. It is Thursday, March 7th, and welcome to episode number 58, Demonstrated Interest and Why It's Important. In this week's news, they're not fact-checking how lies in college admissions can slip through the net. And we're in chapter 58 of 171 Answers, and we're talking about demonstrated interest and why it's important. And this week's question asks about supplemental essay prompts used by private institutions. And we're at the final part of Mark's interview with Dr. David Williams. So you want to be a doctor or a nurse? What you need to know. Friends, if you missed the last three episodes, Nick and I talked about how we decided not to do a New Year's resolution this year, but instead we are looking at a study that Cornell University did of 1,565-year-olds who shared their biggest regrets in life. And the idea is that we want to learn from these 65-year-old gray hairs so we don't make (laughs) the same mistakes. And so what I've been doing is I have been counting down these, and this is the first time Anika's hearing them, just like you, and getting some commentary from Anika. So number eight was taking care of the body. Number seven, not taking enough career risks. Number six, not being honest in life. And today, number five, Spending too much time in life worrying. What are your Ooh. thoughts, Anika? <laughs> are you talking to me again? <laughs> yeah, you're the one who's you're the one who confessed you have anxiety issues. <laughs> worrying this, about what? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like this had your name on it in neon light. <laughs> yeah, you know it. And I listen. Let me tell you something. I own that. I do. I worry about a lot of stuff, and I can't help it. I don't know. It's hereditary. <laughs> Don't be blaming oh, what mom is. and dad. Don't be blaming mom and dad. <laughs> they all I got to blame. <laughs> <laughs> or grandma. Yeah. Well, listen, I totally agree. We got to stop. And you know, it's funny. I've been listening to all these like inspirational podcasts and these women groups and all. I'm in just like inspiration heaven. And lately it's all been about just stop worrying, change your mindset and being thankful. And I'm actually go. starting to catch on a little bit. And so, yes, I, I'm totally into that right now. So, yes, stop Ooh. worrying, y'all. Stop worrying about this college process. Stop worrying about those bills. Stop worrying about those that job. Stop worrying about all of that stuff. Yes. Amen. 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 I will say something really quickly on this. You know, Nick, I, I made a list of every car I've ever had. It's like 14 cars. Now, that counts. <laughs> that counts like cars, you know, Anitra, my wife has had, cars that my daughters, my, you know, one daughter's. Unfortunately, both my daughters have had totals to their cars, so they've each had two. And and I started thinking about every single bill I've ever had, right? Every engine repair, every transmission, every brake job. It's like thousands and thousands of dollars. And guess what? God has provided, mm-hmm. and I'm just here. All that worrying for nothing. Hey, I like it. I love it. Go, Mark. Bring it on. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, Mark Stucker. And this week's news, our article is entitled, They're Not Fact-Checking How Lies in College Admissions Can Slip Through the Net. And this is found, we found this in the New York Times, and it's by Miss Anamona Hartakalis. Oh, that was good. And mm, I thought so, too. You're getting better <laughs> with these names. <laughs> Better and better. (laughs) So admissions officials say that a college admissions are saying that college admissions has become because it's become so competitive, you know, especially with these elite schools admitting only four to five percent of applicants. The pressure to exaggerate, embellish, lie and cheat on college applications has intensified. And very little is done in the way of fact checking. So no one. No one, Mark, is hiring an admissions investigator to go back and see if little Johnny really played football from ninth grade straight through to 12th grade. Nobody's doing that. But, Mark, the most appalling part of this article, oh, my goodness, was the mention of the investigation into the T.M. Landry College Preparatory School. 
Mm-hmm. This is this private high school in Louisiana that doctored these transcripts and fabricated stories of hardship so their kids could get into selective universities. Yes, those were whole big grown up adults that who did that. Mm-hmm. So, but admissions, you know, admissions officers are saying that basically it's it's. I mean, colleges are receiving tens of thousands of applications every year. It's virtually hard to fact check. And even though the whole Landry thing was rare, it's still like it's impossible. Like they can't fact check. They they can't fact check everything. Uh, most stuff actually. So instead, they can only rely on experience, intuition, and the good old honor system. So, Mark, thankfully, my kids, oh, my goodness, are terrible, terrible liars. <laughs> good. <laughs> no. Well, you're good at honesty, no. too, so I think they might have got well, that from you and Javon. <laughs> well, verbally, maybe they can get away with it with somebody else because, you know, me, I can detect that pitch in that voice, lying voice a, a mile away. <laughs> But on paper, they would never make it. They would never make it. Paper, they would probably break out into a nervous rash. So <laughs> I can't imagine the kids and adults, you know, because we think about these Landry adults that were doing this, like leading the lion efforts, that they have the uh, they have the 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 courage to do something like that. Um, and so, what were your what were your overall thoughts of this article, Anika? Well, I mean, I totally get it. A lot of this has to be on the honor system, but I think everything ultimately comes out when, whenever you communicate with somebody and your kid, you know, doesn't have to be like a terrible liar or anything like that. But the, well, what I did appreciate through this article is that they highlight the ways that people do, like when the red flags go up, mm-hmm. like, you know, when the, when the dots aren't connecting, like you're saying one thing, but your college counselor is saying something else mm-hmm. or, you know, there, there are ways that people can tell, like, it just doesn't pay to lie. It mm-hmm. just does not pay the lie. And I've just seen it time and time again through experience that it just all comes out in the end. So, I mean, I get that it happens, but it was it's still amazing that it is it it does so much, especially when you when you talk about these elite colleges um, that these kids are trying to get into. And how about the mark the story that it opens up with where this kid is talking about his dead mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who, you, you know, he that? gives this compelling story about his mom. No, so how about the kid that that the author o- opens this article with about this kid who applies to this elite college, and he's admitted mostly due to this story of this compelling story he made about the death of his mom, and just so happens one day the school calls the house and guess who answers the phone? The mom, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, his admissions got revoked. Mm-hmm. So. What this what this writer is saying is that it happens a lot. We know this. We can't send out investigators to investigate all the things that these kids are saying. And but when they do catch it, it's just by chance. Like it's it's me calling the house and and learning that your mom isn't dead. <laughs> so that's really that's that's really what's happening right now. But so Mark, what was your ta- what was your takeaway from this from this this thing that's happening on you know, these kids lying on these applications? Well, you know what? It's it's a great question. And part of me had a little hesitance about this article initially, Anika. Not that our listening family would do this, you know. Uh, but, <laughs> Never. <laughs> but, but, but if one out of a thousand people kind of hear this, us discuss this and get an idea, ooh, never thought about cheating. Maybe I'm a cheat. Then I thought, oh, do we want to sort of tantalize people with this conversation? But you know, we're trusting everybody and uh, to do the right thing, right? As Spike Lee said, do the right thing. But in some ways, right. I would say this is inevitable, right? Because you've sort of got a confluence of multiple factors. It's kind of the perfect storm. And they're all coming together. Number one, you got the pressure kids are feeling to get into certain schools. And they feel sometimes, oftentimes by their peers, especially in elite private schools and upscale suburban schools, and sometimes by parents or significant others in their lives. Or maybe it's even an overachieving older sibling and they feel the need to measure up and match what, you know, that sibling has done. So you got the pressure the kids are feeling. Two, you got the glut of applications that schools are receiving, right? And it's not just the Mm -hmm. the three to 400 schools, I often say, that are the most selective ones because ever since the advent and proliferation of the Common App and online apps, it means everybody's getting more applications. Even... Even the the schools that are just on financial life support, they're still getting a lot more applications. It's just filling the class is hard because they may get way more apps than they used to get, but they're only getting one out of every eight to actually enroll. So you got more apps, more, you know, for the schools to read pressure from the kids. 
The third thing is the colleges can't afford to hire enough admissions counselors to keep up with the admission workload. So the end result is that admissions counselors are often reading applications in like eight to 12 minutes. And these are schools that do holistic reviews. So there's just simply mm. no time for an AO, which is a mission officer, some use the word AO, to become CIA agents, right? Let alone investigative reporters. Um, mm-hmm. Here's a couple of quotes I like from, from Anna Mona's article. She says, the pressure to exaggerate, embellish, lie, cheat on college applications has intensified, admission officials say. The high stakes process remains largely based on trust. Very little is done in the way of fact checking. And on those few occasions, officials do catch outright lies. They often do it by chance, which you refer to. Another quote I like from the article. But with colleges receiving tens of thousands of applications a year, it is virtually impossible to check them off for cheating, officials said. They said they do not routinely put essays, for example, through plagiarism checkers. Instead, they rely on experience, intuition, and the honor system. So, you know, and it, I was talking to one of my students working with this year. He actually applied to an Ivy League school, early decision. He wasn't admitted. But then, you know, I was talking with him and he's like, you know, life's just not fair. Because he was telling me about somebody else from his school, uh, actually a, a friend of his, who totally fabricated his extracurricular and activity list. And he got in his Ivy League school that he applied to. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was telling mm. me this. And so, mm. um, you know, now obviously there's a lot that, you know, that people don't know in terms of just what recommendations say and, you know, everything else in, in a file. But still, that's hard, right? That's hard. He was sharing that. So, so Anika, do you remember from the article how the schools actually do police fraud? What they said? To the best that they can? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> one thing, the way they look for the inconsistencies, you know, well, they start like, you know, the test scores and the grades don't mm-hmm. match. That was one thing, right? Inconsistencies in the application. Yep. And then in the application and then like certain words or big phrases that just didn't fit like within their mm-hmm. voice in their essay. You know, it's clear that the, you know, that somebody else might have jumped in and yep. edited something. Yep. Um, were the extracurricular activities too good to mm-hmm. be true? And the one that you've mentioned so many times before is the reliance on the counselor. Mm-hmm. Like if the counselor isn't saying you're right. the bomb dot com and you're extra the bomb dot com, mm-hmm. then something ain't matching mm-hmm. up. So those those are the ones that stood out to me. Um, well, those are the ones that she mentioned um, um, that stood out to me the most, I guess. Those are good ones. A- another one is when your activity list um, indicates that you're spending 70 hours a week doing this stuff. And then the mission counselor's like, there's not enough hours in the day. Because I don't know right. if you know this, Anika, but in, in the common app activity list, you have to put the number of hours that you spend on each activity per week. So a lot mm-hmm. of kids don't realize that. Okay. By the time that you put like 20 here, 10 here, 5 here, 3 here, da, da, that's 70 hours just on activities. So that's right. another thing that can give people away. Now, mm-hmm. some universities do require students to sign a sworn statement that they're telling the truth under right. pain of pers- mm-hmm. prosecution. But <laughs> officials admit that they are not usually seeking to, you know, law enforcement. Now. But that is in there. Right. Now, right, there right. was one quote in the article that I vehemently disagreed with. And this, this is what it said. Um, it wasn't by Anna Mona. She was just quoting somebody else. It says, but universities that encourage students to write hard luck stories, experts say, share the blame. So here's what's going on with this. Um, A a lot of times, you know, students feel this this kind of pressure to have to have this sensational essay, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to one of my students, you know, I'm working with now. He's like, I just wasn't homeless. I don't have this story where I was homeless. And so I feel like I'm at a disadvantage in the essay. That's his mindset. And I'm Mm -hmm. reading this really good book I'm enjoying right now, Nika, on on the college essay. And here's a quote. Uh, When I read it this week, I knew we were doing this podcast. Oh, I'm writing this down. Here's what it says. All too often, students feel like if they haven't scaled Mount Everest, check this out, with their pet goat, (laughs) scale Mount Everest with their pet goat while blogging about it, they have nothing to say. (laughs) So, 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 but what this, but what this, some of the experts, according to the article, feel like 
like like the you know the universities themselves are to blame because they encourage hard luck stories. I don't agree with that. Now that comes from two prompts in the Common App. The first prompt, and I'll read it. It says some students have a background, identity, interest, or talent that's so meaningful they believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, then please share your story. To me, that is not saying you need to write about you know some hardship story. Now the second one is a little closer because it says the lessons we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. Recount a time when you face a challenge, setback, or failure. How did it affect you and what did you learn from the Mm -hmm. experience? But the thing is, this is just one. Mm -hmm. There's seven prompts in the Common App, and all they're trying to do is for you to reveal more about your personal background. So I do not feel that it is fair to blame the Common App at all, um, you know, be Oh, but can I sure. counter you Go on ahead. that? Because mm-hmm. I remember specifically Jalen dealing mm-hmm. with this and that prompt saying, because that's how we felt. We felt like you had to have some amazing story. Like, I remember it saying, like, what obstacle did you overcome? And I remember Jalen talking about his baseball. It was it was awesome the way he ended up doing it. But he started out trying to just, like, come up with some some hardship like he felt pre- and I felt the pressure too I mean I'm honestly that's how we felt like we had to say something like uh, you know not to the extent of being homeless but it had to be something so that pressure well we definitely felt that pressure now it just so happened that it worked out that he would you know he was able to to we, we it took mm-hmm. us some time it, I remember this I remember this like mm-hmm. it was yesterday it took us some time to think through what he was really trying to say because what Jalen was doing was he was trying to be so dramatic and so obstacle-ish. I was just like, Jalen, just speak to what you really mean. You just, <laughs> just make a word just, up on me. <laughs> I straight up and down. Yes, I did. <laughs> I love it. I love that's it. That's how we felt. That's, that's how it. we felt. It was, he was going, I remember uh, we went through like multiple exercises. I was like, Jalen, just stop. Just think about what you really are trying to say. Like, think about how you really felt in that batting cage. Like, think about like, Man, it was pressure. I'm going to tell you, Mark, it was pressure. So here's what I will say about that. I think that pressure comes from some of it's from media sensationalism. I don't know. Anika, do you ever remember this? this, um, It actually became a movie. But in in 2010, a well-publicized memoir led Liz Murray uh, talked about my journey from homelessness to Harvard. I don't know if you heard about no, that. No, and I, I, I had not heard of that. No. Yeah, and it became a movie. I actually started to watch it, but I got bored forty-five minutes. And you know me in movies. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, no so, so, so some of some of it comes from like the media perception, but I think the biggest contributor to that is a misunderstanding on the part of students and parents as to what makes a good personal statement stand out. So, and mm. uh, you know what I mean? It really isn't that you scale Mount Everest. It really isn't that you, you know, that you <laughs> almost died of cancer when you were 11. You know, you right. don't have to have this dramatic story. So I, I, I really don't, I'm going to push back again. You push back at me, I'm pushing back on you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see how the application reinforces that i think that's a misperception in the minds of the public that ooh, if i don't have some you know rags to riches story or some heroic story then how am i going to stand out so i that that's just mm-hmm. that's my thought but um mm. i do want to say this because remember what our regret was last week not this week <laughs> last week in our regrets number six not being honest in life And and that was it. So I want to go back to that as we kind of wind this section up. And I found this really good quote on a guilty conscience. And here's what it says. Guilt upon the conscience is like rust on the iron. It both defiles Mm. and consumes it. Gnawing and creeping into it is that does which at last eats out the very heart and substance uh, of the metal. So, hmm. it, you know, it's just not worth um, going through your life having that gnawing feeling and also wondering, did I really get in on my own merits? It was because I I scammed and cheated and, you know, 
and, 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 and got in, you know, really, really through inappropriate means. So hmm. those are my thoughts. Any final thoughts? Yeah, we're going to have an integrity podcast on after the 171 <laughs> answers. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. All right, friends. So we're up to episode 58. And our longtime listeners know that we go through a chapter in every episode of a book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions. And you can get the book if you're interested at 171answers.com or Amazon. And this week's chapter is called What is Demonstrated Interest and Why Is It Important? So, Anika, what were your thoughts on the chapter? Well, you clearly made it clear what demonstrated interest is. And that is basically the kid is showing, demonstrating to the school that, yes, I am genuinely interested in attending your school. I'm I'm not just fluffing you around. And you listed quite a few ways that the that the child can do that. Now, if you like, I have my top four of the ones that stood out to me um, from the chapter. Well, well, before before you do that, Anika, why don't we why don't we talk about? Well, let me ask you the question: Why would demonstrated interest be even important at Alto School? Well, I would think. Well, again, because you, I know you said it before. It's all about schools or businesses. Yeah, we get that. They got to fill their seats. So it's a matter of planning for them to say that, okay, we're going to be able to fill X amount of seats in the next session. And so this is important because it's basically assuring them, you're you're just telling them that you're coming. I mean, I mean you're assuring them that they're going to be able to to plan accordingly in, in when they're filling that class. Um, and I thought what was interesting, the the opposite of what you called uh, of what you said, what you said, demonstrated interest was what is the uh, what do you call it, the phantom applicant? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there's, you know, you know, you know by now, Nika, you're learning that we have all this terminology right. in admissions, right? Uh, yeah. And so, one of the terms you'll hear is a couple terms you'll hear are the term phantom applicant or stealth applicant. Mm-hmm. And a phantom or a stealth applicant is an application that just it might have just well, it may as well just dropped out of Mars. <laughs> Because you have no idea how this person found out about you. I mean, they're not in your database. You know, there's no record of ever meeting anybody at a college fair or at a, <clears throat> at a school visit or <clears throat> no contact whatsoever. I'm like, how did they hear about us? <laughs> and and so I say, you know, at a there are a lot of schools that you do not want to be a phantom or stealth applicant because they're just going to say, you know what? This person has had no contact with us. What are the chances are they going to come? I, I would go back to you with a question that I asked you. Why is it important? Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't even say it's about the business aspect of the school. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way I would say is, it is your job in admissions is not to give somebody a trophy and say you met the admission standard. That's not your job. You know, your job is to enroll a class, a gifted and talented class, and please all your stakeholders. That's your job. So you can't do your job unless you bring in all the different people you need to bring in. And because it's so competitive, and for the most part, it really is. I always get this mixed up. Buyer's market, seller's market, buyer's market, right? Is that the right term? Where the where the applicant has the advantage because there's one of you, all these schools buy right? for you? Yes. Yeah. So you, you basically you can't do your job unless you have some way of being able to kind of predict who's likely to come in all of the different with all the different constituencies that you have to please. You know, um, does that make some it sense? Does, yes. Yeah. So why don't you share a few of your favorite methods that you were all ready to share before I cut you <laughs> off? I can tell you're just itching there. I can just see the love, the zeal. <sighs> Alacrity was all there. <laughs> you stripped so, it away. So no, why don't you... It's still here. <laughs> so I'm going to give you your chance. So share some of your favorite methods. And, you know, we're doing another deep dive on demonstrated interest. I think it's episode 75. It's a ways away. Mm-hmm. So we're not going to cover everything on this because I can really go on this topic, Anika. And I have a mm-hmm. lot to say already. But 
Go ahead and say share your methods. All right. Well, don't go too far, but um, but but okay. I'm gonna tell you the reason why. I, let me preface with the reason why I chose these because when we're immersed in this process, it's easy in any process in life. Let me just say that it's so easy to forget the basic, the most basic things. Like you, it, it happens mm-hmm. all the time, time and time again. I know we mm-hmm. all know what I'm talking about. So just to visit the school's website and sign up for the mailing list. How about that? How easy is that? But how easy is that to forget as well? Because I've already told you, oh, I forgot. We forgot to sign up for this doggone school's mailing list. Mm-hmm. So um, the other one. That's one you like. Because it's easy. I like. Yep. Because it's easy. The second one rang a bell because I remember specifically Davidson College told us this when we were at the info session. When you attend mm-hmm. these info sessions, make sure you fill out the cards. Okay, so let's just say mm-hmm. that your school is in one city, then they go to another city, then they go to another city or mm-hmm. wherever. You go to, mm-hmm. you go see them at info sessions three times. Fill mm-hmm. out the cards. Fill out the information cards each and every time. And I remember mm-hmm. Davidson told it. They literally told us that because I remember a kid, just the way you outlined it in the book. I remember a kid saying, oh, I already mm-hmm. did it. And they were like, no, go ahead and fill it out again because it would be in your best interest. So that mm-hmm. um, that was a little nostalgic there. So that was good. And then mm-hmm. this other one, this, uh, and I'll stop with this third one, but um, when you receive an email, open it. If there's a video in it, watch it. Because that brought me back to the conversation we had quite a few episodes back when we were talking about the, you know, the data mining and the way mm-hmm. these schools are tracking you. Mm-hmm. They know when you're engaging. Mm-hmm. Like you, they, they know they sent you an email. They know because, you know, if anybody that manages a MailChimp or anything else, they know that you have the diagnostics, which you can go in and see if people are looking at your stuff and clicking it and, you know, all the basic things. Schools are paying attention to that. I sent you a video. Did you watch it? No, you didn't. OK, maybe you're not that interested in me. So the, I'll, I'll, let me just start with the top. Okay. Well, that was good. We would like to thank every listener who has financially supported our show. We want to make sure that our friends of the show know that you absolutely can make a one-time gift or you can sign up for one of our monthly giving levels. Recently, we received a lovely letter from a college counselor who made a gift and said she wants to support the show quarterly. And that is also okay. And if you make a one-time gift or a quarterly gift, you may still be entitled to the same benefits we extend to our monthly donors. That's right. For a gift of $60 or more within the first 12 months, you'll get all the benefits we provide in our sustainer plan. And a gift of $120 or more in the first 12 months, and you'll get all the benefits we offer in our expander plan. So to support the show, all you have to do is go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. Either click the monthly gift tab or the one-time gift tab. And be sure to visit our frequently asked question page, which is also located at yourcollegeboundkid.com for more details. This is also where you can learn about the sustainer plan and the enhancer plan. Your financial support helps us defray the sizable expenses that it takes to deliver all of this great content that is aimed to empower you and your family's college admissions journey. Different people have different abilities to give, but whatever you can contribute will be greatly appreciated and it will allow us to remain commercial free. So thank you in advance. Thank you. So so I want to take a step back and, and just kind of give the big picture Really get philosophical here for a second, Nika. What we're we're trying to do with this podcast. So if someone is on a pre-K level, they're brand new to admissions, and they stumble on our podcast, we hope we don't go over their head and they can follow everything if they're a complete neophyte. However, if you're on the PhD level and you've been an admissions counselor for 30 years um, and you listen, we hope and expect you're going to come away and learn multiple things you did not know before you listen to the podcast. So that's what we're trying to do, span from pre-K to PhD. A second objective, which kind of coincides with the first objective, is suppose you're at a, let me use an example on this one. Suppose you're at a play. You know, when you go to the play, there's halftime at the play, the curtain's closed for intermission. So you know when the curtain's closed, all kinds of talk is going on backstage amongst the actors, the actresses, okay? Um, But you're not supposed to hear that talk. You're not privy to it. There's a reason why the curtains are closed. And what we're trying to do, one of our goals is to kind of pull back that curtain because there's a lot of talk that happens in admissions offices behind closed doors that really the public just can't hear. The public heard it all. They really wouldn't be able to do their job. But there's things that an admissions counselor cannot tell you that we want to tell you. you, So we're trying to pull back that curtain and let you know how things really work and reveal that to you. 
the things that an admissions officer would lose their job or be severely reprimanded, no matter how honest they were. I tried to be very, very, very honest when I was in admissions, Anika, and I really took a lot of risks that way. But mm. there are still some things I just could not say. You know, I just couldn't say that. And so here we're trying to do that. And the reason why I say all that is when it comes to the subject of demonstrated interest, which, by the way, that's kind of a mouthful. That's a six syllable mouthful there. <laughs> do you remember what I referred to it in the chapter is? And a lot of this is another admissions t- talk again. Yeah. D.I. So I'm going to call it D.I. for the rest of the time because it's just easier to say <laughs> D.I. And it, it sounds cooler, too. <laughs> Let me go with D.I. the rest of the way. So, D.I., there is more opaqueness or lack of transparency on the whole subject of D.I. than any other aspect of how applicants are evaluated. So, a lot of times when you'll hear an admission officer talk about holistic admissions, you'll hear them emphasize five things. You'll say, you know what? Here's what we do. We look at your grades. We look at your courses. We look at your test scores. We look at teacher and counselor recommendations. We look at your essays. I'm sorry, six things and your activities or extracurriculars. So those are like the six things, right? Grades, courses, test scores, <clears throat> teacher, counselor, recs, essays, and you know, extracurricular activities. They'll say those are really the six things that are involved. But I would contend there are three other major things that determine who gets in and who doesn't. One is match and fit. One is hooks, which we'll talk about a lot more coming up in other podcasts. And then the third is demonstrated interest. All right. And so you want to check in on episode 74. We're going to do a deep dive on hooks, which are basically institutional interests. Just in case you're curious. But why is it? Because I will contend of those three that are not mentioned as often, you'll most likely hear people talk about match and fit or hooks. They may not use that word hooks. They might call it institutional interests or institutional priorities. But demonstrated interest is the thing that is the least talked about. Any idea on on why, Anika? I don't. I, and I, but I do. This is what I do remember and know is that the school yeah. that told us that said, you know, we don't care about you. The number of times you come to the school, that doesn't matter to us. Like the, they they downplayed the demonstrated interest. And I think I, I felt like I mentioned this recently in another episode. Um, but then they came back and said, oh, Jalen, if you don't yeah. apply early decision, then I don't know. But if you go in early decision. Yeah, you talked about that last yeah. week. That was Duke. Yeah. We talked so, about yeah, that, but, remember? But that goes to the so, the whole downplay up. Like, you downplayed it, but it really does matter. <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's And there's some reasons for that, why the downplay occurs. But first of all, just to kind of help people to understand demonstrate interest a little bit more, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give another one of my corny examples. So, Anika, suppose your boss said, we need to hire 20 more talented people for this university. So we're flying you to Los Angeles, and we want you to interview 40 people. We've aligned these incredibly talented people, great resumes. And is your job to <coughs> offer jobs to 30 of these 40, and we're expecting that 20 of them are going to be here. So you're not evaluated on how many people you s- extend a job to. You're evaluated on how many people choose to accept the offer. If that's mm-hmm. the case, then you're not only looking at their credentials, because you're going to get evaluated by the, whether, they, whether they accept the job offer. You're going to look at other things like, do I think they're enthusiastic about what our company offers? Do they look like they're a match for our corporate culture? You know what I mean? Those kind of things. I don't know if that worked mm-hmm. or not, but I'm trying to help it people did. to understand why this is so important. We talked about yield last week. I said it's one of the two things I feel is least understood, uh, most often un- misunderstood. I'm sorry. Um, and, and this is why, because you got to deliver. You have to. It's extremely formidable to bring in a balanced class and please all 30 plus multiple stakeholders in all areas. So, but let me talk about why I feel it is so often not explained with complete candor by the admissions officer. The first is that there's an apples and oranges um, 
comparison going on here when it comes to the definition of of demonstrated interest. So a lot of times you'll hear an admission officer say, when talking about DI, just what you said, Anika, they'll say, you know what? Some schools, like, they give you bonus points if you visit a place three or four times, but we don't do that. So don't think we do that here. And they'll define demonstrated interest as the more times you come, the you know, the better it is. Well, you know what? That's actually a straw man argument. Because even schools that track demonstrated interest with elaborate formulas, nobody wants nobody wants like you just to be just to be hounded like that. So, but oftentimes it's caricatured in how it's explained. All right. That's one reason. Second reason, and this is just this being transparent. Nobody wants to be stalked. So what happens is sometimes when people hear demonstrated interest, right? They think, oh, so the more attention I show you, the better it is for me. And then people just go overboard with that. So in other words, if I visit your school four times, it's better than if I visit once. If I email you every week, it's better than if I email you once or twice. That is not what anybody wants. So they think that if we explain it, then people are going to misunderstand it and they're going to become stalker kid, which is so annoying. A third reason why it is downplayed, and like I said, most of these reasons are legit, is that the interest needs to be genuine. You know, I'll give you another example. This is an example. I was listening to an AO, a mission officer, this week. She was talking about a scholarship weekend at her college, right? And so for their scholarship weekend, like a lot of scholarship weekends, they have interviews. So for the interviews, like the kids wait out like in the lobby. And then, you know, when one comes out, another one goes back in. So, you know what this admission officer would do, Nika? She she would, like, hide in the lobby. And, of course, (laughs) no, she would. Because she would learn a lot by how the kids interacted with each other. Because they're talking about giving, like, major money away. (laughs) So she was looking for the kids that say, you know what? You can do this, you know? (laughs) <laughs> I, you know, and no, or, or how'd it go? Congrats. He was looking for that interaction versus a kid that was just on the phone. that was not communicate, non communicative. And so that was a very valuable part of what she learned about the applicants. But you know what? I strangely, I strangely understand that. That's well, good. <laughs> Even though it sounds insane, I, I actually get it. I, I, I totally respect but, but, but this, <laughs> well, this is the point I'm making about demonstrated interest, though. So let's say she told all the interviewees, I'm going to hide out in the lobby and I'm watching you <laughs> and I'm watching you to see if you're like out of boying and glad handing everybody that goes in and giving well wishes to everybody that would like defeat mm. the whole purpose. Right. And so that's right. another reason why it's downplayed, because people feel like it will lead to this disingenuous communication. Um, mm. And some schools, Anika, they're not they, they don't refer to DI as demonstrations. You know what they call it? demonstrated understanding, you know, or some schools even demonstrated knowledge. In other words, it's not so much that you're excited about us, it's that you get us. You understand who mm. we are. So that's what okay. why, so that so that's some of the reasons why it's downplayed. Now, not every college does use DI. What you'll find is big state schools tend not to do it. They don't have the admission staff to do it. Large public schools rarely do it. Where you'll find it is with private schools mostly that do holistic admissions. And what you'll find is there's an inverse relationship between how high a school's yield is and how important DI is. So in other words, if you're Harvard and Stanford and you get eight out of every 10 kids that you admit, then you're not that conscious of who is showing up and who's opening emails and and, and who is... um, doing all the different things that are involved in how DI is evaluated that we're going to talk about in episode 75. So Mm -hmm. you're going to assume for the most part, they're probably going to come, but it's, that's a small number of schools. Anika, very, very, very small, because remember what I said before, all these schools are trying to bring in the most gifted and talented class while having a lower acceptance rate, which means they don't like wasting acceptances on people that are not coming. So right. most of the schools, even most of the extremely selective schools, are very, very conscious. And I will say this. I was listening to TCU. I was met with a TCU representative a few months ago, and she was just up front. She's like, look, we use a one to five scale on demonstrated interest. You either get a one, two, three, four, or five, and that's part of your evaluation. If you apply early, you definitely are getting the five for that. 
but then they have a whole scheme down, you know, versus four, three, two, and one based on other behaviors and activities. And a lot of times when schools say we don't do demonstrated interest, they're talking about we don't do that. We don't have this elaborate formula that's generated and used to determine and and create these statistical probabilities of whether or not you're going to come. Because there are organizations out there, Nika, that do that. There's a whole organization in our CCUA that builds these elaborate models that schools use to predict. So sometimes when schools say we don't use demonstrated interest, they mean we're not doing all that. But that doesn't mean Hmm. my definition is very different. My definition is does whether or not a student is likely to come play any real role whatsoever in whether they're admitted. That's my definition. Hmm. But most times when schools say we don't do, we don't use demonstrated interest, they mean we don't have an elaborate formula where we get certain points for this, certain points for that. That's what they mean. And they're trying to protect it because they don't want disingenuous behavior. Hmm. So what do you think? I think it actually makes sense now. <laughs> Good. Seriously. So what did I say that helped it to make sense? Well, the fact what that did I, say? Well, I, I get it because I get it with, with in my own work practices. Like I don't want somebody See, to, I have to use me. that example. Yeah. I mean, I to use that example of totally. you going out and having an interview 40 people and you better bring 20 back. Well, that and just I don't need you hounding me. Like I don't need you stalking me. Vendor. Yeah. Like vendor. Don't yes. call me again. Yes. Vendor. Like back up off. Yeah. So I, I told Totally, totally understand that. But uh, yeah, there it is. And, 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 and I think you could also understand that if you just say, oh, we're tracking your interests, mm-hmm. that that's going to be interpreted by somebody as, I better camp out in front of your door. Like there's always somebody that's going to, or if, I mean, I'm embellishing it, but you know what I mean? I'm going to, I need to keep always, calling the admission office once a week. There's always one. We know that one or two or three probably. <laughs> Guess what? There's surprised. more than one. <laughs> Let's get off of here. This is the next subject. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark. Our question this week is from Ivan in Santa Rosa, California. And I'm going to read his question, this parent's question verbatim. It says, I had a question about private school supplemental essays, more specifically for the Ivies. I was wondering if the supplemental prompts change every year or if they stay the same every year. Thank you for your help. Well, thank you, Ivan, for your question. Mark, yeah, what you got? Yeah, Ivan, thank you for a great question. Well, first of all, let's let's talk about what supplemental essays are. Nika, I think you can handle this. Can What, what are the supplemental essays? It, I, sh- I think I can. So these are the essays required by the colleges when you're filling out your college application to say, you know, tell me about yourself or tell me why you want to come to this school or whatever question they want to ask you. So I know that um, one, I'll give the example of Jalen. He had to use the Y Davidson. That was his big essay for his application. Um, so that's an example of a supplemental essay that he had to complete. Exactly. So the idea with the supplemental essay is that it's a school specific essay, which is the term I use for it the most. It's an essay that each individual school asks and no other school may ask that question. I mean, maybe they possibly do, but chances are chances are it's very tailored and geared to that school and only to that school. So mm-hmm. I like to call them school specific essays because I think it's more lucid by that name. But you'll hear them referred to as supplemental essays as Ivan did. Another term you'll sometimes use, um, I know that Peter Johnson, the late Peter Johnson, the great Peter Johnson, who I served with on the board of Go to College New York City, director of admission at Columbia for a long time, calls them institutional essays. So those are three names you'll hear. So that's first of all, so everybody knows what they are. Okay, now I'm going to answer Ivan's question really simply and straightforwardly. Ivan, sometimes they change, but usually they don't change. Sometimes they change, but usually they don't change. So, Nika, so what happens is you've got your main essay, right, particularly for the Common App, right? 650-word personal statement, personal essay. That comes out in January, even that the Common App doesn't open until August. Mm. And a lot of, so the question is, so what I, so I'm working with my juniors right now, like we're doing multiple drafts. I mean, I have sessions on Saturday and Sunday with people doing multiple drafts of this. And so the question becomes, 
and this is, I think, what Ivan is getting at. This is why I want to go here with it. If the prompts stay the same, then I can get working on them earlier because I can look up what last year's prompts are. Because remember, Anika, the Common App doesn't open until August. And in some places, okay. school starts in August. And right. so what I do when I'm working with students, there's two things that I want students to have done before they start their senior year. I want them to have their test scores done so they're not dealing with test scores. And I want their applications to be complete, all their essays written. Um, now, it's tougher for schools that start in August that way, for schools that start in September. And I under, and there's always going to be a little bit of tweaking because it's not it's pretty common for a student to, oh, all of a sudden they want to add a new college, right? So in the fall. But for the most part, I want at least 80% of the applications, preferably 90% of them done. That means essays written. So the question becomes, do you take a chance and start working on these school-specific essays now? Or do you wait until August to you see whether or not they changed? That's really mm -hmm. the question. And I will, in most cases, tell people to start working on them now. Why do you think I would say that, Anika? Well, you're trying to get them out the way. You're minim it's all about minimizing stress. But mm -hmm. ooh, that still goes back to my point, though, Mark. Like, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I would come. I would push back on you. I'm like, Mark, why are you telling me to work on something I don't even know what it is? So it's a great like, question, and I would tell you two reasons why. One is probably have a 75 percent chance that they're going to stay the same. You know, I mean, schools do switch them up, but most of the time they don't. So chances are really good. Even if you don't, it's going to be such a good exercise to go through because these things are hard and they count a lot. So the time you actually have to put in doing a school specific essay, even if it does change, it really helps you to understand that college more. Now, mm. I'll give you um, a couple quick examples. He asked about the Ivy League, so let's stick in the Ivy League. I was with the Dartmouth, which obviously is one of the eight Ivy League schools, um, <clears throat> representative probably six months or so ago. And he was saying, uh, you know, we don't care if you get a 31 or a 32 on the ACT. We couldn't care less. But you only say, you don't want to know what we care about? That school-specific essay and what you put. And we'll spend so much time going back and forth talking about what you said in there. Hmm. And, and then he went on to say that the director of admissions, this wasn't the director talking, he said he gave them a project, all the whole entire admission staff, and it was hours. And there were something like 43 different uh, school-specific essays that were acceptable to the director. And he was like, you all as a staff, you talk about all of these and come up with six that you like and present to me. And he said they were in there for hours. Why? Because these things, they really count a lot. Mm -hmm. And they count a lot because they reveal so much about a student and they reveal so much about whether or not a student is a match for an institution. And I don't want to get into this too much because we're talking about this again in episode 64. We can pick it up there with more detail. But let's stick with Dartmouth. And I'll, and I'll tell you, the other thing is, Anika, uh, Anika, is that these things are hard. They're hard to do well. So sticking with Dartmouth, this is an example of Dartmouth's uh, school-specific essay from last year. Uh, this is last year. Okay. While arguing a Dartmouth-related case before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1818, Daniel Webster, class of 1801, Dartmouth alum, delivered this memorable line. It is, sir, a small college, and yet there are those who love it. As you seek admission to the class of 2023, what aspects of the college program, community, or campus environment attract your interest? Now, you might think that doesn't sound that hard. Yeah. Want to know one reason why that's so hard? It's a hundred yeah. words. Do you know how fast a hundred words go by? Yeah. And at least with the Common App, there's seven different prompts. You got a lot of variety. You're reading the same thing over and over and over again. Like, it's just hard to stand out when everybody's writing on the same topic. So these things are hard. So I like people to start early, actually, and take the chance that they will stay the same. And even if they don't, I feel like it is such a worthwhile venture in terms of what you'll learn that it will still help you better understand that college. So 
what do you think? Because that's all I wanted to say, because we're coming right back here six more weeks and doing even a deeper dive into these school specifics. What do you think, Anika? Well, uh, that was pretty deep. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> I, I, I was not, yeah, I was not there. The question is, did I convince said, oh. you? Because I, you were like, I'm pushing yeah, you back. Did. Yeah, okay. you did. So now you no, see value. Yeah, I mean, because I, 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 do, I do understand the writing exercise for mm-hmm. anything. Uh, and oh, I do listeners, know that it's, listeners, it's, you guys don't know this, but Anika's a writer. She can write her butt off. I mean, she's a right. Well, you know what? They might know that because remember before we talked, we put a plug in there for your handle at mom.com blog. We haven't put a plug in that for a while. Yeah. You yeah, can go to handle at yeah. mom.com and it's, read her yeah, blog. But it's, 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 been- it's coming along. It's coming along. Don't, don't go there yet. I'll tell you, I'll tell you okay. when to really visit. <laughs> she's had a lot going on, juggling a lot of balls. Well, she hasn't been able to do her normal writing, but, but you understand but, the writing process. But I have been writing, but I but I do understand the writing process, and I do know that it's a mm-hmm. uh, it's a muscle, like it's a muscle that you mm-hmm. have to build, and I don't underestimate ever exercising that muscle. Let me just say that. So yeah, that yeah, was yeah. So we that took was Ivan's question, Thank you, Mark. No, no, and we took Ivan's question, and instead of just answering, you know, do they stay the same or not? We kind of took it to the next level and we said, is it worthwhile to start working on them until you find out for sure whether or not they're released? By the way, they normally come out usually like in July, even though the Common App opens up in August. A lot of times schools will reveal, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're on their mailing list or even on their website, oh, these are going to be our school specific essays. You know what, Anika? I know that I had said, remember last week we had that conversation and I said, why is it that, you know, you don't seem like you're enjoying the process? <laughs> you know, and I said, am I am I the one having this disquieting effect on you over here by, you know, by putting pressure? And you said, let me think about that. Remember that? Uh, yeah, I did think about it. I did. So do you want? Do you want? Do you want to? Uh, you want me to give you another week and answer that next week? Because I feel we've gone a little long on this episode. No, because you it's gonna be, it no. Because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm gonna tell you from the heart. Because okay. I'm gonna yep. tell you the reason why I'm not. I feel like I'm not having the fun that I would like to have. Mm-hmm. It's just because my pro- like my personal project schedule is on one thousand. Like mm-hmm. between my my job's workload and my mm-hmm. own personal projects, mm-hmm. I mean, I literally fall asleep every night praying that more hours are added into the next day by some magical happening, and I know that ain't happening. I see. So I mean, it's just you know, just welcome to the belly of my beast. And mm-hmm. now I tell you what, though, Mark, I could be struggling for time and balance and not know what the heck I'm doing. I see. I <laughs> so see. it could be worse. It could be like totally worse. Um, so I'm just, I'm just not at that place where I'm coasting. Like there's well, a, I've got this, a lot though. of work to do. Mm-hmm. Am I doing anything to raise your angst level? No. Oh my you God. Pa- you pause a little too long on that one. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, uh, no, seriously, Mark, if no, I promise you like deep down <laughs> pinky swear all to the Lord. No. I mean, I'm telling you now, what do we say? Mm-hmm. Knowledge is power. And let's define power, okay? Mm-hmm. Because again, I could be crawled up in a corner somewhere, like balling my little head out, trying to figure out what in the world is going on, still mm-hmm. trying to balance me and my kids and everything else. Knowledge is power, and we can define that in so many different ways. And no, it's just listen, Mark, keep giving me your brain. I will be fine. All right. Well, let me just say <laughs> one thing. Let me just say one thing that. People don't have to internalize and master every single thing that I'm talking about all the time. If you're implementing 10% of right, the stuff, you're right. ahead of 90% of the people. That's right. That's ex- Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. So there it is. Bam. My answer. Woohoo. Don't have to wait till next week. I love how you say bam. I like that. Just bam. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not cool enough to use that, Dad. <laughs> Okay, friends, hopefully you've been enjoying our four-part series with Dr. David Williams as he talks about, so you want to be a doctor or a nurse? So he starts out in the final segment talking about what about physician assistants and what about what opportunities are available for physician assistants? And then we finish with some real lighthearted stories. Dave's got the greatest stories. I put him on the hot seat. He tells sort of his 
brushes with greatness, some celebrities he's met, his stories. So it's more of a lighthearted uh, episode as we wind down, but I think it's one you're going to really like. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. So I want to ask you about one other one, yeah. and it's something I've heard so much more of in the last 10 years than I ever heard before. And I've looked it up, and both this field as well as nursing are projected to have over 30% growth rate, yes. uh, more, more than four times the, the national average for projected growth rates for jobs. And that is physician assistant. And I meet a lot of people that tell me I'm trying to decide between being a physician assistant, being a, being a doctor. Yep. Uh, what can you tell us about being a physician assistant? Because it's uh, it's just it's, it's definitely increasing its popularity. My first ten years doing this, yeah. I don't remember so many people asking me about it. Now I see a lot of people on you know on that course. Well, physician assistants and nurse practitioners are under the ca- capa- uh, under the category of physician extenders. Those professions that extend the capabilities of doctors to do their job by providing sort of like a, a an ancillary sort of ex- extended arm. So. To be a physician assistant, most programs now, because it's becoming increasingly competitive, do require you to have a a bachelor's degree. From the bachelor's degree, I believe it's two years currently to become a physician assistant. There may be some programs still out there that don't require a bachelor's degree. I'm not sure, um, but I think most require a bachelor's. But once you become a physician's assistant, it's like nursing. It gives you the ability to be involved in a wide variety of clinical um, uh, cl- clinical uh, positions. For example, physician assistants are, wa- are widely used in emergency medicine. Uh, we divide emergency medicine cases into like five categories, one being the most severe, five being the less severe. Uh, it used to be that physician's assistants would take care of the the most minor cuts, bruises, sprains, minor colds. But uh, I am now seeing physician assistants work side by side, take care of uh, heart attacks and strokes and um, severe acute abdominal pains. Things that were only under the purview of the uh, physician are now also being taken care of by physician assistants. Now, the key about a physician assistant is you must work under a doctor. So when I work with a physician assistant, they're working under my license. So they must report all the cases to me. And I have a medical legal responsibility to review all their management and in many times see the patients as well and make sure that they're doing the right thing. Uh, But I can tell you that in many of the emergency rooms I'm working at, there's more physician assistants often than doctors. There might be one doctor and he's working with two physician assistants. And I am uh, critically reliant on physician assistants to run a good portion of the emergency room because I physically can't see that many people. Physician assistants are also widely used in the surgical fields. So cardiac surgeons and orthopedics and uh, other surgical fields use physician assistants not just to assist them in the surgeries, but also after the patients are in the hospital, many times the uh, people who are seeing the patients post-operatively and making sure that they're healing well and their pain is managed and they're not suffering complications are physician assistants, and they're reporting back to the surgeons. And that allows the surgeons to spend more time in the operating room and less time actually in the hospital seeing their patients after the surgery. So it's a field that's expanding. Uh, most physician assistants now are making uh, close to or over six figures. And I anticipate that uh, it's a field that's going to uh, continue to be uh, well needed, despite whatever technological changes we talk about in terms of roboticization, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So this has been great, Dave. And, and you know, Dave and I, we can talk all day. Our listeners, we, they, we literally, Dave and I literally talk five times a week. And, and that's probably on the low side, isn't it, Dave? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes <laughs> multiple times a day, you know, we, we will talk. We're... we're 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 that close. Um, I know your wife is around. If if Frida, Doctor Doctor Frida Wims is available, I wouldn't mind asking her um, if she has any advice for future future doctors. Yep, well, she's coming right now. She's on the couch. 
Oh, actually, she's giving me a thumbs up. So I, I think I think for now, I'm sure we'll have a part two, and we'll bring bring her back. But right now, I think she says, "Okay, no, no major that, that, corrections." That that means you did a good job. <laughs> you get, you're going to get dinner tonight. Get dinner. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so Dave, you, you you listen to the podcast all the time. You know you know that we put interviewees on the hot seat. But Absolutely. I'm going to mix it up a little bit because you. I'm going to ask you some questions I don't ask everybody else. So Absolutely. let's start out with this. Other than Mary and Frida, because because I don't want you on the couch tonight. What what's the best decision you've made? Uh, um, you, you know what? My my daughter said to have a child, and and that is absolutely the best decision. <laughs> it, it really has. But she, she answered. She answered it for you. She's right I, there. Just, but you know, we're going to go through a period of crisis because I, I'm very proud, Papa. My daughter got into Yale uh, with a lot of help from your college bound kids. So I want to give a play there. Thank you so much, Mark, for all you've done. Uh, but. She remind. Oh, I have to say something. There was a lot of there was a lot of uh, humility for Dave. Had to take humble pie there. <laughs> I worked with Dave's daughter for some time, and um, of course, Dave was pulling for Princeton, <laughs> pulling for his home school. But but Lauren, he ra- he raised an independent thinker, you know, who has her own mind. And and as much as he tried to to get that tiger blood in her, she said, "No, I'm 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 going to New Haven." <laughs> so so we got some good news. Um, Couple months ago, when the early when early action decisions came up for you, yeah, but yeah, she she is uh, my wife number one, my daughter number two. Um, you know, God has been so good to me in so many ways. So you know, I don't want to get too much into weeds on that. But those are the top three decisions I, I really think. And then number four, <laughs> I, I could easily say medicine, but my medicine has taken so many twists and turns. But what I can say that <laughs> as the that so much of my life has been unplanned, but as the decision points have come along, um, I'm very grateful that uh, God in my family has guided me into making those decisions that have really turned out to be so so wonderful and special. And you look back and you don't know why awesome. you took those, you made those decisions, but you realize they were the right ones. So great, great, great. Now, if you were 18 and you were back in college and yeah. you couldn't be a doctor, what career would you select? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say career. I would rather say pathway. Okay, there you, I'm because cool with that. I'm cool path, with that. A pathway is, uh, um, y- you know, I, I believe the world is heading to a variety of crises. Uh, I believe there's a crisis that is brewing in this country, and I believe there's a crisis that's brewing internationally. If I was 18 years old, the best advice I would give is to get involved, to be involved in what's happening politically, both on a local and a national level, to fight what's happening within our country and our world against those forces that seek to divide us and to bring us back to an age of tribalism, which will inevitably lead to warfare. To find a passion and uh, 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 a passion and uh, an issue that that you really care about, and focus on making a difference. Because unless we have eighteen-year-olds willing to get involved, I truly believe that our country will continue towards this crisis. All right. And I have to ask you for a couple of books. I'm a, you're a reader. Yeah. Dave's been a reader all his life. As a young kid, he always had a book in his hand. Um, and so um, so I'm not going to ask you for one, but a couple books you've read that have really impacted you. Okay. What You, you gave me this book, Mark, and, and it's the, one, the most recent one I've read, but uh, it's um, – it's by Frank Bruni, <laughs> and it is where you go is not who you'll be. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like that book. <laughs> I, I, I love that book. And, you know, I, I love that book because um, especially for – it blows against so many of the myths that we are being promulgated. My, my daughter's going to Yale, but you and I know that there are 50 different colleges that she could have chosen that she would have loved. And she would have done just as well. And I think it's so 
And one thing I'll say, yeah. Dave, is that you really believe that yeah. at your core and that, you know, that yeah. some people say that, you know, and it's just spin. I mean, you, you and I talked about that over and over and over again. And yeah. so um, I know that you do believe that. Yeah. And, and you know, I, to that point, remember, I was born in Canada. And remember that, uh, and I was very clear to my daughter that we're talking about a very small list of U.S. schools, and then we're back to McGill and University of Toronto or excellent schools that are a fraction of the cost of U.S. universities. So I never bought into this myth that you had to go to these great, these top 20 on the U.S. news, and that's going to make or break your career. Uh, I gave her a challenge. She met it. So now, unfortunately, I'm stuck with paying that April 1st bill. <laughs> not, hey, it's, I got news for you. It's not just April 1st. I know. <laughs> it's, I know. But, but, but she, she is going to a, a, a school I really like a lot. Those, she's, she'll, have, she'll have a great experience there. But I do yeah. encourage everybody of that podcast, as you uh, said to me many times, start with reading that book. So, so that's been number one. Um, you know, there's a classic book that I I sort of recommend as well, which is called uh, "Rich Dad Poor Dad." Uh, it's by mm -hmm. Robert Kiyosaki, and I and it mm -hmm. because I think it's important for kids to have a financial perspective going into life, because uh, so many mm -hmm. times kids don't get a financial perspective till they're like half a million dollars in debt. And and it, it, this book just talks about different ways of looking at finance, uh, different ways of looking at at business and real estate and so forth, and and multiple revenue streams and, and, is big on that and book. And I know that multiple revenue streams, and I think it's relevant because when you look at a process they're about to bark in, which can potentially put them in so much debt, uh, I like people to have different financial perspectives. Um, going through. That's great. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought that yeah. up because you're actually the first one to bring that up. And, and uh, all of our listeners get great ideas from our guests and their books. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 58 is a website. It's www.ed.gov. Now, this is a U.S. Department of Education website. It's got great information when it comes to federal student loans and grants. It's a great place to get educational press releases. Also, if you like stats, they've got data and they've got a lot of it. There's lots of research and reports on this site. Now, ED's mission is to promote student achievement and to prepare for global competitiveness by fostering education excellence and ensuring equal access. It was created in 1980 and by combining several federal agencies. So there's a lot of information on here. You've got policies on federal financial aid. You've got information on um, national attention on key educational issues. You've got information on discrimination and equal access to education. And there's lots of really, really good links on here. So it's just one of those overall really good comprehensive resources. Uh, so I recommend this as well. We will now return to my interview with my lifetime friend of over 50 years, Dr. David Williams. Uh, I'm, I want you to share a couple really lighthearted stories that I think are, 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 are it will be interesting and, and we'll, we'll call it a yeah. day. Um, you met somebody really, really interesting in college. I can't remember if it was Princeton or Harvard, yeah. but they had been in jail <laughs> and they had a powerful story. So you have to tell that story because it's, it's one of the more interesting stories that I've heard. And I think our listeners will like it. Well, his name is Dr. Tom Tartar. He's well known because he was on a, a PBS series that talked about Harvard physicians that were part of the, the new pathway. Uh, Tom and I got to know each other. He's a great guy. Uh, to describe him, I'm an African American. Uh, obviously, he he was a six foot three inch, about three hundred pound, really scary looking white dude from Texas. <laughs> I met from the first day I was there, and uh, we ended up having some beers and a conversation, and became one of my fast friends. It turned out that he grew up in uh, Texas, a uh, broken family. Um, foster kid, and by the time he was uh, 14 years old, he had dropped out of school 
had taken up with the motorcycle gang and was uh, actually running drugs uh, from Texas to Arkansas. And he ended up getting busted when he was 16 years old and getting convicted and uh, spending uh, 18 months in uh, Texas and Arkansas uh, state prisons. Uh, it turned out he worked out a deal with both the Texas and Arkansas system where he spent half his time in Texas and the, the other's time in Arkansas. Uh, while he was in uh, prison, he did two things. Number one, he took up weight lifting, which I guess all kids in prison do. And uh, he also got his GED. And he got out of prison, uh, he said, about 70 pounds heavier than when he came in and considerably smarter. And uh, he applied and went to the only school that would take him at the time, which was SUNY Brooklyn. Uh, when he went to SUNY Brooklyn, he um, actually continued his weight training and actually became the NCAA uh, powerlifting champion in his weight class and actually got all the way to the Olympic team uh, when he actually had a horrific injury where he was doing what's called a clean and jerk, and he snapped both of his wrists, um, requiring major surgery and ending his career. At that point in time, he went back to school and decided that he wanted to become a doctor and uh, worked hard, got decent grades, and uh, ended up applying to a variety of schools and his counselor convinced him, you have an interesting story. You should really apply to some really special schools. And he did. And he got, ended up getting accepted to Harvard. So the great thing about it is at their graduation, he has uh, two diplomas uh, hanging on his wall. And one of them is that uh, you have now, Harvard's diplomas were, are in Latin. So, you know, he graduated from Harvard. And then a bigger diploma in when... It was like, you have now completed your time in Texas and Arkansas State Prison for Grand <laughs> Theft Auto. <laughs> oh, that uh, was great. That was... Yeah, he later became an emergency physician, and, uh, you know, he's on the program Nova, uh, so you can look it up. Uh, but he's the only guy I know who've gone from Texas and Arkansas State Prison to uh, Harvard Medical School. So it's a proof that... There is always a path of redemption, no matter who we are. So there we go. And there's grit right there. And yeah. so two other things, Did, a couple of brushes with greatness. And you have a, a, a Barack Obama story for us as well. Yeah. Um, well, Michelle Obama and I went to Princeton and graduated together. And Barack and I played uh, basketball together when I was in Harvard Medical School. And he was uh, in law school. I don't know if he even remember me now, but when I did meet him several years ago, uh, he looked at me and said, ah, I know you, Mr. Sharp Elbows. At the time, we really didn't like <laughs> each other. <laughs> the reason why is his, his, uh, uh, his uh, future uh, brother-in-law was Craig Robinson, who at the time was... Uh, a Princeton basketball star. So he always got picked up on the good pickup basketball teams. And I was always playing against him. So I don't know if he'll remember me other than that. He was the, I was the guy who was always elbowing him underneath the basket. <laughs> well, Dave, Dave and I played a lot of basketball right. growing up together outside in his neighborhood at the Y. And this is going back a ways now. <laughs> and I still remember those elbows, Dave. <laughs> so I'm sure he remembers. I still remember your elbows. I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and one more. I, I, I was not invited to any inauguration parties, and I wasn't given any cabinet positions. So let's just clean <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You actually don't live that far from his uh, Chicago home, I don't think. Do you? It's not that oh, far. Oh, yeah. We, he just he <laughs> about three it. blocks down. But, you know, he, he he's in D.C. now. Yeah. So we're. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. And one more, one yeah. more brush with greatness. Dave's got a great LeBron James story, and I and and I remember the phone call I got on this one. So this one, let's 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 share this and then wind down and call it a day. Yeah, I'm working at Little Company of Mary Hospital, and this kid rushes in, having just broken his hand playing basketball. So I come in, and sooner or later he comes in with this entourage, and this entourage is saying, "Oh, we got a." orthopedics at Northwestern and you got to call this orthopedics at Northwestern. And I'm like, what's the deal? It's just a broken hand. And 
Then uh, sooner later, uh, a couple minutes later, I get this call from this doctor at Northwestern. It says, oh, yeah, we know him. Just send him down. And, and I'm like, boy, what's the big deal? So I call up Mark, and I'm like, hey, I just took care of this kid in high school. Do you know Mr. LeBron James? <laughs> he goes, yeah. <laughs> so that's the only time I knew ever met LeBron. I almost took care of his broken hand at Little Company of Mary Hospital X years ago. And needless to say, I, uh, I still don't have Lakers season tickets. So that tells you my role in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, this is this has actually been a blast. Uh, you know, obviously we talk we talk uh, almost daily, but um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I appreciate you trusting me to to guide uh, Lauren, your college coach, uh, through the college process, and mostly I appreciate uh, what's what's now a fifty year old friendship. So. Yeah. Uh, I love you, my my man, and I appreciate uh, you so much. I'm all back at you, my friend. Love you so much. So, and I, I really appreciate the great things you're doing on your podcast, and and more importantly, the impact that you and your podcast has had both on my family and my daughter. So, uh, the only thing is, when are you going to launch uh, the medical school version? She's got two years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? Before we go, I have to say one last thing. Yeah. That, for those of you who have my book, 171 Answers, uh, there's a story there. Dave would not leave me alone to write a book. Remember that, Dave? That's when are you right. going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? So if you like the book, you can credit Dave. If you don't like the book, you can blame Dave. But I would not have written that book if he didn't just not leave me alone until I wrote it. <laughs> it was a great book, Mark. Right. Thanks so much. Oh, oh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening, my friend. All right. Take care. Next week in the news, Liberal Art College Mega Mergers. And we'll be in Chapter 59 of 171 Answers. And it's all about what your child needs to know about social media presence in the admissions process. And next week's question is about how to communicate a student's gap year experience to increase their college options. And Mark has another special interview series beginning next week, this time with Ms. Susan Tree. She's a 40-year veteran in admissions and college counseling, and they're talking about writing the personal essay. Don't miss the opportunity to fill in the gaps and bring yourself to life. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenbaugh. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.